Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, in life there are some burdens that are just too uh, too heavy to carry, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and uh, I am the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, influences, how they got started, all in a very light and conversational kind of way. Uh, and if you'd like to uh, subscribe to this podcast, and uh, we certainly hope that you do, uh, you can find us over at Apple, over at Spotify, and you can find all of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel at In The Seats. Also, if you'd like to follow us on social media, that'd be great. You can find us either on Facebook, Twitter, or the Instagram, or IG as the kids call it, uh, either at it's, at it's Podcast One, excuse me, or at In The Seats. And finally, you can visit us over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca, where it all began, where our hardworking team is cracking away on movie news, reviews, interviews, and any sort of fun stuff that we can think of. On this episode, we are talking with writer director Amjad Abu Alala, who is the, uh, the driving force behind the new film You Will Die at 20, which is playing. Uh, it virtual cinemas now across North America, and it is also the Sudan's uh, entry for this year's Oscars. And it's a it's a really interesting story because it's it's the, it's the story of uh, uh, young uh, Muzamil. And if I'm mispronouncing any of these names, I apologize in advance. Now uh, he was born, but the, the village's holy man predicts that he's going to die at age twenty. And, and Muzamil's father can't stand this curse, and he, he leaves home. Meanwhile, uh, Sakina, his mother, has to has to raise her son as a single mother and, and becomes very overly protective. And then we read... Well, we join the primary meat of the story when Muzamil turns 19, and he's looking to live life. And, and then things get interesting. And it's a story about sort of understanding the line on how to live and how to pay reverence to to to, to maybe maybe some more traditional ways and uh, sort of the mix in between and just then especially the kind of emotional baggage that you can and you can't put on a on a young man coming into the world and sort of figuring himself out and it's a it's a fascinating film and we talk with uh, Amjad not only about the film but uh about the festival run, his entire experience putting it together, uh, the uh, the burgeoning uh, Sudanese uh, film scene, which is still pretty new, but it's starting to, it's starting to come together, and uh, just what got him started, what uh, what influenced him, because he's a he's a really unique guy, and uh, I enjoyed our talk with him, and I hope you do too. No, I mean, first off, I mean, obviously, congratulations on the film, man. Like, it was powerful, and I mean, it really struck me. And I'm just kind of curious, what was the origin of the story? Because just seeing this young character has to sort of carry the weight of sort of the premise of the entire thing was really quite fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad the film that uh, you saw, you feel it that way. Thank you. Tell me about the origin of the story. Well, uh, the film is based on um, a short story by Sudanese novelist Hamur Ziada. Hamur, he lived in Cairo. And um, the, uh, it just like it catched me, um, took me up the fall when I, I wrote about this, this world, you know, of Sufism and village of Sudan, how they, they, they believe on the superstitions to that limit. And, and actually also I love the idea of how Sudanese people grieving, how they deal with, with the death because I've been through that when I was a kid and when my aunt died and I just saw all my family wearing black for two years, uh, grieving her. Mm. So I just felt like there is many things in one story I wanna tell, we can talk also about the political side of talking to, to Muzammil as one citizen who surrounded by all the authorities that he's, he need to, to obey and follow, like, you know, the religious authority, the, 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 the family authority. 
and also the, the political authority somehow on, on both of those. So I just felt like this is the right film for me to do. Well, and I mean, I love just sort of, especially, I think uh, the, the Suleiman character, just in terms of having the balance of, on one end, like you say, there is these traditional roles, there are these sort of, there are these restrictions, there are these sort of ways that you have to live your life. And, but and on the other side, there is sort of this desire to just live your life. And it is sort of the pull between the two. And especially when you're a young man, it makes for uh, sort of an interesting character dynamic to sort of to see sort of the, the push and pull between sort of, I guess, maybe traditional ways versus modern ways or just being a young man kind of ways. Uh, maybe I was inviting Muzemmil here to, to, to know a new ideas. So, so I invited Muzemmil to, to meet Suleiman. <laughs> you know, I wanted him to meet Suleiman. And definitely I can say Suleiman is reflecting me and the crew, everyone in the crew, my crew that made this film had something from Suleiman. You know, we are the new the new generation uh, looking further. We are trying to, to, to take Sudan a step up by keeping the tradition and I, and I think and I think I was celebrating the tradition in somehow in the fall but at the same time it, 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 it could be harmful it could be painful for 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 some kid like Muslim and other kids still live there in Sudan and in the villages and and they just they want to be united with the world uh, why that happened maybe because we had a government during when I was shooting the film, it, it, it just separated Sudan from the world, you know, the sanctions and all of that. And mm -hmm. it just wanted um, uh, the time to, to stop. That's why maybe in the film you notice that, that there is no one knows what is the time is. Right. And uh, the father, he asked her, asked the mother, how old is he now? She told, like, count it if you can, you know. So I just felt like the time was was not there, not just in the film, I mean in Sudan. Everything is still like the same at this and that villages, you know. Um, so yeah, Suleiman for me, he was the window and he opened the window for Muzemil by opening the cinemas. And, you know, I use the cinema like a window that Suleiman used. No, and I mean, it really does feel like it's uh, not just a window for that, but I mean, also in terms of I'm kind of curious just about film culture in general from a Sudanese standpoint, because how much of one is there or is it just sort of what you can get from sort of the West or from, you know, Hollywood or even sort of other more sort of popular mm. foods as opposed to making sort of like genuinely sort of character driven stories like this one is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, maybe, you know, I've been born and raised in Dubai. So I had access to watch uh, European cinema, American cinema, Indian films, by the way, in Dubai, you watch a lot of Indian movies. Uh, but definitely I was so engaged with European cinema and American cinema. Uh, in Sudan, there is no cinema industry or cinema way because this, this film you will die at 20 is the number seventh in Sudan history. Really? And it's the first one from 20 years, you know, feature, fiction feature film. Wow. So, yeah, I can't say there is a way of Sudanese cinema. I think we are creating this mood and we are creating now this, uh, uh, we're trying, we are trying, me and my colleagues, you know, we, we're just trying to, to see what kind of cinema that we have because we have very unique uh, country. Very unique because it's, it's, it's in the heart of Africa. It's that mix between African uh, culture and, and, and Arab culture. Uh, maybe you notice that in the film, it, things are really uh, different from the Arab films that you used to see and different from the African films that you used to see because it's just not one of those, it's both. So I think we are, we are recreating, we are rediscovering what kind of cinema that we have or we can do. Uh -huh. I'm I'm kind of curious because I mean it strikes me as something really interesting because like you say you're from a cultural standpoint it really feels like it's existing on sort of like this really hybrid line in terms of 
not being sure which way to go or maybe even embracing all elements. I'm kind of curious from sort of a boots on the ground standpoint, like in the Sudan, like is it cinema of the world that gets embraced or is it just a question of whatever they can get their hands on at that stage? Uh, maybe I need to understand the question more. I, I, I think I'm really curious about sort of not just influences for you, but maybe in a, in a, in a country like Sudan for, for other filmmakers, what would be sort of the primary driving influences of what other people would be watching? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, um, I think that I'm more into Hollywood films. Mm. So there is people uh, into Hollywood films and into Egyptian cinema. Okay. And definitely Indian cinema also. They like Indian cinema. But Hollywood, uh, yeah, I think they are more into Hollywood cinema because, you know, um, the last 30 years, the government, they, they closed the cinema. They closed the cinemas. Mm. So what they have access for is the TV and the TV brought films from Hollywood or, you know, the um, commercial Egyptian cinema. So, uh, but for me, and let's say for most of the, um, the filmmakers, they are into Hollywood cinema that kind of independent or, you know, the film that uh, had something, uh, had a story, had a more drama, drama on it, or the European cinema, you know, more engaged to both. How have you found reaction of the film? Because, I mean, I love how it does, like you said previously, it's open to more of the Western ideas of just trying to live your life and be open to all sorts of different things, but it still pays a lot of reverence to sort of the traditions of the past and sort mm -hmm. of the, the, the older ways. Uh, I, I, do you believe that the film is not uh, screened in Sudan enough yet? Uh, but now with being the film in Netflix, and I can say Net Netflix is in there. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's in Netflix uh, Middle East. Uh, I, I think it became part of the new cultural war because oh. after we took out the Islamic party and now we have the new government, the liberal ones. And so some people, they thought like this film is made for this era. Right. And so, so the people who, who like the new Sudan and the liberal and the open-minded, they love the film. And the people who think this is part of the war in the old uh, Sudan and the 30 years Islamic, they are totally against it. And I totally accept it. <laughs> 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 what got you into storytelling? What made you want to be a filmmaker? Uh, I just, I fall in love with storytelling since I was 10. I was right. I, I, I used to, to write short stories when I was 10. I used to read a lot of uh, novels that bigger than my age. You know, I fall in love with Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Isabella Lindy and since I was 12, maybe, you know? So I think it started with me by the novels. Okay. And that's why maybe my first film is uh, adaptation for a book. Um, I think that's how it started with me. And there is like a great Egyptian director. His name is Yusuf Shaheen. Uh, Yusuf Shaheen um, uh, is great. Um, he was like, he, he took it Cannes Film Festival. He was always in Cannes and he took Palm of the Palms in 1997 uh, for his total work. So I, I think Yusuf Shaheen is the one why I started to note that I love cinema. And then I discovered Tarkovsky and I discovered Stanley Kubrick, by the way. I love Stanley Kubrick like a lot. Um, and I discovered Theo Angelo Polis, the Greek. And I think I, discovering those names and their films, it just let me feel like I want to be part of it. So I couldn't study cinema because my family doesn't believe that the right way to go. So they sent me to study media. Well, I used the four years of studying media and I took the camera and I started doing films on the university, you know, and I, I created a group uh, of cinema and theater, actually, and I love theater also. So, yeah, I started doing films since I was 18 years old. 
my first shortfall. And till now I have like 15 uh, short films, uh, seven as a director, eight as a producer. Now, I mean, at least from a personal standpoint, I've always found that like watching films is probably the best education for understanding them and sort of not only making them. And I'm kind of curious, not just from your perspective, but mm. from like sort of a regional cultural perspective, how has sort of the advances in technology that we've seen in like the last 10, 15 years really sort of not only influenced you, but maybe the people coming up behind you and starting to make films and being interested in film on that level. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very nice question because I always talk to the new generation, you know, when someone said me, I'm just want to study cinema, but I can't, what should I do? I just like, you need to, study but if you can't you need to study by yourself watch films analyze it read the reviews and come see it again and and i think that's what i did when when i studied media not cinema and i did it so that i was so lucky to be living in dubai because dubai can brought some great people around you in workshops so i had a great uh, workshop with the, with the great abbas kurstami Oh, wow. Uh, and I made a short film that supervised by him. He supervised me on a script. He supervised me. Uh, I didn't allow him to, to attend my shooting day, but he supervised <laughs> me also <laughs> on the edit. <laughs> you know, uh, and he liked it. He liked that. He liked the idea that I did. I said, no, not my, not my set. No, another director on my set. <laughs> you know, I loved him. Uh, God bless his soul. And also I took another uh, workshop with Azhar Farhadi, script writing wow. workshop. And I was so lucky to have that, you know? And also uh, Dubai Film Festival, I was always there for 14 years. And I, I started also work there with Masoud Amrallah the, as assistant programmer. So I had the chance to watch a lot of films. I had a chance to meet with the producer, director. So I built my contact industry in somehow in 14 years before making my, you will die at 20. Uh, seven years ago, I started also work for, we started first uh, cinema film festival in Sudan, uh, Sudan Independent Film Festival, I'm head of programming. And that's also was a way to watch films and analyze it and select it before doing You Will Die at 20, like just a few years before. So that helped me a lot. Now, I mean, I'm kind of curious because, I mean, especially given what's going on in the world with the health crisis, people can't mm. go to the cinema, but at the same time, there are so many options that people have to watch at home that are bubbling up. And I mean, there's opportunities now for people in Canada because I'm, I'm in Toronto for to watch Sudanese films, but vice versa, there's chances for people in the Sudan to watch Canadian films. And I mean, it's really sort of making for an, an interesting time where yeah. the art form of filmmaking can sort of get back up to the surface. Whereas in maybe in a few years past, especially with a lot of the Hollywood stuff, we would get sort of the noise would sort of drown out sort of the real artistry of filmmaking, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, yeah, sure. Definitely, I miss cinema. Definitely, I miss the, the, the oh, dark too, yeah. hole, you know, and um, I, can, I kind of classic, a little bit classic on that, and I still in love yeah. with cinema, and, and I still wanted people to watch them. Well, in Toronto, I, I did like the North America premiere in Toronto. Uh, the film was there after just a few days after we won Lion of the Future in Venice. And it was a great screenings there. So now, you know, the film had some chances till March and then everything stopped. And we had a chance to screen the film uh, theatrically in uh, France uh, for two months, maybe in Tunisia, Egypt. Now it's still in Egypt here for seven months, actually. Still in cinemas, but, oh, you wow. know, working 50%. Right. But it's working for seven months now. Uh, yeah, I mean... I understand how important uh, having HBO, Netflix, uh, you know, all the VOD uh, playing around and try to cover or recover what COVID did or what another reason did. But I just, I, I would always like if Netflix and HBO focus to do that with giving the chance for the film that produced to go cinemas first, to go at least for two weeks for right, cinema, right. to go festivals 
because for me, like if I if I'm producing a film for first time director, he had the the, the right uh, to stand there and do the Q and A face to face with people. I mean, when face to face come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I mean, I think really the beauty of this film, just to, to, to put a bow on it, is that it, it's, it's one of those films that reminds us that no matter where in the world we might be, I mean, especially when you're a certain age, there's going to be, there's, there's such similarities across all of us. And I mean, we all have faced a lot of the very similar problems and challenges in our lives. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious for you as a storyteller, like no matter what kind of film you make down in the future is like, is that the ultimate goal to make something that really will resonate sort of universally, not just locally, but sort of globally? Definitely, because I would say again, that being born and raised in Dubai, Dubai is a very cosmopolitan city. So I used to sit in one table with 10 of my friends and everyone from different na nation. And I would speak all the accent, even, you know, even the Arabic accents. I speak like Tunisian, Lebanese, uh, everything. And from the world, you know, I have Mexican friends there. I have many different nations. So I didn't build myself. I'm not built to be uh, just talking about Sudan. You know, right. so maybe that was one of the way I chose the, the story. Yeah. What if the same story happened in Mexico? You know, and they have that. That could be happening there, by the way. Right. Yeah. And what if the same film or same idea, same story had just happened in India? And by the way, after Toronto, there is Indian producer. He's talking to us right now, <laughs> till now, negotiation to take the rights of Your Die 20 and do it as an Indian film. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Just waiting to see the dance. And <laughs> you know, Sitanissa, the character, I will make it bigger. Maybe. Oh, I would, love, I would love to see this as a musical. Oh, for me sure. too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So even to continue just about the, the cosmopolitan or the universal language, uh, that's remind me when I was working on the music. Right. With Amin Bouhafa in Paris. So he was so into, he wanted to discover, you know, musicians, you know, he wanted to discover a new um, a fusion between Sudanese and, uh, and, and, you know, international music. I was like, no, just keep it universal music. And I will, in the sound design, I can put Sudanese music there. Already I have the wedding, I have. I want, you know, if someone is sad, we don't have to hear Sudanese sadness, just to kind of hear like the feeling of anyone can relate to, you know? Yeah. So it was a risk to take, but I think it works in somehow most of the film. Wow, I think I think I think everything you did in this film works perfectly. And I just want to say, you know, thank you again for the time and congratulations on the film, man. It's a beautiful piece of work and I look forward to the next one. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, cheers, man. This was a nice conversation. Thanks. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.